Hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, another Social 204 Lecture on Culture, our third in the series. Uh, we've talked about norms. We've talked about values and how norms are manifestations of values. And we've talked about sanctions, the rewards and punishments that reinforce and get us to follow those norms, which are manifestations of values. The third part, we've got a couple things to sort of squeeze into the third part on culture. We're going to talk about uh, why we have these rules. We're going to talk about the concept of ethnocentrism. And we're going to talk about where culture comes from, which finally will give me a chance to talk about hip hop. Um, yeah, we'll see how that goes. So the uh, so let's start with this discussion about um, why we have all these rules. And we've talked about these rules on three different levels, folk ways, more ways, laws. Why? Why do we need all these rules? Um, some people really like to rebel against the rules. Some people insist that other people follow the rules, or they want other people to follow the rules. They necessarily don't want to follow the rules themselves. You feel those people would just follow the rules. Um, so the, the easiest way to answer this question is from the perspective of our three paradigms. So let's do this, shall we? And the easiest explanation for why we have all these rules on all these levels uh, and and why they're a manifestation of values and why they have sanctions, all that stuff, why we have culture, is uh, from the functionalist perspective. And the functionalist would say, very simply, that the reason we have all these cultural rules, norms, folkways, mores, rituals, laws, is because it's functional. There you go. That's all the functionalists ever say. It's functional. I mean, think about if, you know, the alternative, of course, would be if we didn't have all these rules, we would have chaos, right? If we didn't have laws, obviously, we would have problems. I mean, there was a, a long period in Montana where they decided, because they were like a live-free state, that they didn't need a speed limit, and reasonable people could decide how fast they needed to go on the interstate. And so there was no speed limit. And I went to Montana uh, to do a research project and interviewing a bunch of militia members. And the real reason I went to Montana is my car at the time was a Mazda RX-7 Turbo, and I really wanted to see how fast that baby could go. Uh, about 120, that was about enough for me. Uh, they don't have that law anymore in Montana because so many freaking people died. <laughs> a lot of stupid people like me were like, hey, you can go as fast as you want to. Uh, and so you have to have rules to have a functioning society, even if it's a folk way about, you know, do you eat this with a fork uh, or do you eat it with your hands? Do you tip? Do you not tip? How much do you tip? Do you kiss somebody on the cheek when you say hello? All that allows for a smooth functioning organism. And if something, some norm starts to become dysfunctional, like the norm of racial segregation, then it would evolve out of the system, right? That evolutionary organism model. So functionalist, the answer is we have all these rules, we have all this cultural stuff because it's functional, helps the organism function. The conflict folks, of course, would say, mm, not so fast, there's probably a power dynamic at work here. There's probably somebody who gets an advantage over some other group of people by having these rules. I mean, think about all the mindless rule following we learn as, at, when we're kids. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of whatever it is, uh, you know, we learn to follow the rules and therefore we learn to follow authority and therefore we learn to not challenge the status quo, right? We learn to accept the power dynamic and keep things as is. So the, the conflict, folks, conflict folks would focus on the power dynamic and how all that those rules create sort of mindless robots, right? The cogs in the machine, as Marx would call them, um, who just ac accept authority and don't challenge authority. And the conflict folks would really want to ask, what's the power dynamic between these rules? And for example, the, all the rules around gender. What is behind the notion of the custom of a man opening a door for a woman? All right, is it functional or is there some power dynamic? And not just that the doors, you know, were in olden times were too heavy for the weak women with their spindly little arms to open, so the strong men had to open the door. No, that's not it at all. It's the idea that the men are the gatekeepers, that men allow and grant access for, for women into places. I had uh, students in, a, in one of my classes at a community college I was teaching at in Atlanta do an experiment where they broke the rules, where they went on and broke the, the rules. And we'll, we'll talk about these things called breaching experiments. And I had a student 
uh, who was a female student, who broke the rules by opening doors for men. And when she opened the door at the college, you know, guys would be like, oh, okay, thanks, whatever, and didn't really um, pay much attention. But at her church, when she opened the door for the men there, the men would not go through the door. And they'd say, no, you first. And she'd say, no, you first. And you'd be there forever because it's the job of the man to grant access of entry to the woman and not the other way around. So we, from a conflict perspective, we will look at what the power dynamic is. And you better believe there's a lot of gender power dynamics in the rules that we have as women shave their armpits and men don't, right? There's a definite power dynamic at work there between male and female. And there can be similar ones about race and class and, you know, other power dynamics that we have. Okay, from the symbolic interactions perspective, we just learn it, right? We just develop a shared understanding about what rules to follow, uh, what rules it's okay to break, what 55 miles an hour means, 65, right? What uh, rules are important, what rules are taboos. We kind of develop through our socialization, through this sort of interaction that we have, a kind of understanding of when the rules apply. Sort of means, you know, why, why can't you say this word in this setting? You know, what is an obscenity, right? There's a whole thing about words there. Like, what what word is obscene? It used to be goddamn was obscene. My grandmother couldn't say the word hell in public. There's an old card game called Old, old Hell. Oh, hell. That's right. Oh, hell. <laughs> they would, she would call oh, heck, because she thought saying the word hell was wrong, right? Now I go, what the fuck? Uh, you know, the notion of obscenity has changed quite a bit since we have a president who brags about grabbing women by the... So, um, so from the symbolic inter interactionist perspective, we develop a shared understanding of the complexity of these rules and what rules mean and what rules don't mean. So that's the answer from those three paradigm perspectives. So be ready to, to think about that, folks. Now we're going to talk about a concept called, I just edited something out because I couldn't talk, uh, a, a concept that is going to relate to something we're definitely going to get into a little bit more in this class. Uh, we're going to talk about something called ethnocentrism, ethnocentrism, which is, I think, a really important thing for sociologists and anthropologists to understand because we're ethnocentric all the time. So here's your tech, textbook definition. Textbook. I'm drinking emergency. That's the problem. If I was drinking coffee with something in it, I might be a little bit better off I'm trying to avoid the COVID. Um, ethnocentrism. The tendency for a person to judge his or her own culture as the standard for judging any other culture. Let me say that again. The tendency for a person to judge his or her own culture as the standard for judging any other culture. So this is the notion. Oh, we just lost something. Um, this is the notion that we think our way of doing things is the right way of doing things. And so the most obvious way that we, we see this is in the food that we eat. That we eat normal food, and the people over there eat weird things. I mean, I for a long time, I didn't understand how people, J Japanese people, but people in general, but you know, could eat sushi. It just seemed so bizarre to me that people would eat raw fish wrapped in seaweed. That was so disgusting. You should have a cheeseburger like a normal human being. Uh, I haven't had a cheeseburger since 1982, but I've eaten a lot of sushi in that time because it's delicious. But, you know, other people's foods can seem so weird to us because we, our food is normal. So we're ethnocentrism about a lot, a lot of things. We're ethnocentrism uh, about, uh, you know, I, the English drive on the wrong side of the road. No, they just drive on the other side of the road. We're ethnocentric about uh, religion. This is a really... This, relates to the chalice and the blade. Our religion is always the correct religion. Our religion is the one true way of God, and everybody else believes in some mumbo-jumbo superstitious, that's not the real religion, that's not the real God. Our religion is the real religion. Uh, I, I, as a kid growing up in the South, I briefly uh, wanted to be a missionary. I wanted to be a missionary because I thought you would get to travel to all the cool places you read about in National Geographic magazine and bring the good word to the people. There is nothing more ethnocentric than missionaries. I know some of them do some good work. They help brush teeth or get fresh water, or stuff like that. But, you know, they come to places where there may be, be a faith that has existed for tens of thousands of years, and they say, hey, our faith that's only been around for less than 2,000 years is the one true faith. And if you want to get into heaven, you got to eject the faith that you've had for millennia 
uh, and, and take our religion because your religion is wrong and our religion is right. That's judging somebody by somebody else's, by, so judging somebody else's standards by your own standards. Now, we do this sort of all the time. We're so ethnocentric. And ethnocentric is, ethnocentrism is rooted in stereotyping. It's where a lot of um, racism comes from, as we'll talk about uh, the idea that our way is the right way and their way is the wrong way, the Amer America first kind of thing. Um, yeah, you know, we have religion and they have superstition, that kind of stuff. Um, one of the ways that we, uh, if you've ever traveled abroad, you've probably experienced some ethnocentrism, like why, they're doing things a weird way. They don't use toilets the way we use them, or they don't, you know, eat the food that we eat, or they don't worship, or they don't dress, or there's, you know, we do it the right way. Their system is wrong. Our system of government is the best, our system of worship is the best, our system of dressing is the best, our system of dating is the best. <laughs> like Everybody else is sort of weird compared to us. And one of the examples, I think this is a really valuable way of thinking about it, is how we so freely use the word primitive. Those people are primitive. You know, they're in some other place they're primitive because they don't have, you know, apps on phones. They may not even have phones. They're like primitive people. Uh, Primitive, you know, there's a value judgment that they're somehow less than because they're primitive. Their primitive people are, can be much more advanced than we are. I'll give you a really good example. When we think about, about mental health, um, there is a... So when we think about mental health, you know, you have a diagnosis of something like schizophrenia. If you've got someone who's diagnosed as schizophrenic, you want to sort of remove them from society and give them lots of medication to try to calm down the voices in their head. Right, that's the American way, and that's the most advanced way. And of course, the way we do it is the best. There's a tribe in uh, Eastern Africa that if you're hearing voices, you are touched by God. You are, you know, connected to the divine, and we're not going to reject you as a crazy person. Crazy person, we're going to bring you in and lay hands on you and try to gain this divine insight that you have. And clinical psychologists will tell you that the kind of community integration and the human touch is actually much more effective in dealing with the symptoms and the problems that emerge because of schizophrenia than drugging somebody up and warehousing them. So who's more primitive, them or us? Maybe we're more primitive. When the white people came to America and discovered it, discovered it like it wasn't here before, uh, you know, they would refer to, refer to the people that were here across the North American continent as savages, that they were savage and uncivilized. Uncivilized, you know, they were just civilized differently. There, was an, there were millions and millions and millions of people who lived in North America who were sort of wiped out by the diseases that the Europeans brought. But they were highly civilized and highly civilized society that was advanced in many ways politically culturally, religiously, it was just different. But the ethnocentric Amer uh, Europeans were like, these people are different from us. They must be savage beasts and not be able to understand high level thinking like us good European folk. That was being very ethnocentric. And so we see this a lot. We see this a lot uh, in wartime. In wartime, we tend, to, and this is a theme that we're gonna come back to, we tend to dehumanize the enemy. You know, that they're ragheads or gooks or nips or you know, whatever the derogatory racist term we're using because they're less than human. There's a famous cartoonist named Ted Geisel. And Ted Geisel uh, was a, a popular cartoonist in the 1940s. And he is one of the guys who uh, made all these sort of very racist cartoons about the Japanese during World War II. Of course, we're, we're the enemy of the United States during World War II and drew them as sort of these, you know, subhuman little animal-like characters that were just just the most racist sort of art you can imagine. Uh, but it was used to fuel the ethnocentric notion that Japan was a, you know, a savage place and these people weren't real people and America, you know, must defeat them because um, they are some type of, you know, monstrous enemy. Um, and then uh, Ted Geisel, after the war, went to Japan and he met the people who he had spent, you know, many years characterizing and satirizing in his cartoons and found... Uh, they were actual people. Uh, he went to Hiroshima, uh, where we had dropped the bomb and killed millions of people and found the humanity that was there. Uh, and then he became later a very famous uh, cartoonist when he changed his name to Dr. Seuss. 
And as Dr. Seuss, Ted Geisel wrote a book called Horton Hears a Who as sort of an apology for his ethnocentric view of the Japanese. That book, if you sort of read that children's story, is really sort of saying, hey, don't judge people who are different than you. So, uh, so that was a really powerful notion of ethnocentrism. So what do you want to do if, you, if ethnocentrism is bad? The alternative, or sort of the flip side of what we hope to do, is called cultural relativism. Cultural relativism. And what cultural relativism refers to is just judging a culture by the standards of its own culture. Instead of judging it by our standards, is it good, is it functional, is it helpful within that culture? So, for example, we might look at something like headhunting, you know, in a, a South Pacific island like New Guinea, and we're just like, these prehistoric barbarians who are chopping off people's heads and shrinking them down and hanging them up in their huts, you know, what's wrong with these people? Why don't they be good people like us who only drop nuclear bombs on people and, you know, incinerate them? Um, if you're being culturally relativistic, you'll try to understand what head hunting is about. Why do people do that in that tribe? In that culture, the stealing of a head is not only stealing uh, an enemy, um, but taking the wisdom that they have in their head and integrating it into your tribe. It's actually seen as sort of a functional way when you're kind of at war with somebody of taking the wisdom that they have away from them and bringing it into your tribe. And so within the, the framework of that tribal culture, it sort of makes sense. It's very functional, even though it seems incredibly barbaric to us. Of course, if they were to look at us and our high murder rates, they would think we're pretty barbaric, right? I mean, we're murdering people right and left. We have kids getting shot in the head and they would be like, what's wrong with these barbarians in America? They're just, you know, slaughtering each other. Uh, thousands and thousands of people every year are being slaughtered for, for what? At least when we kill somebody and chop off their head, it's because we're gaining their knowledge. So again, who is more savage? But I want to give you an example of the challenge of ethnocentrism. So again, ethnocentrism, let's judge cultures by their own. I was, whenever I talk about this, I think I was in um, London a couple years ago, uh, two years ago, doing um, uh, a trip uh, on behalf of the U.S. Embassy, and I wanted to get a souvenir mug. This is when uh, Prince Harry and Pr Meghan Markle had just gotten married, and I was getting a mug. Um, and um, I went, you know, a mug with the royal wedding on it. And so I went into a souvenir shop on Oxford Street. And there was this American guy right in front of me doing the exact same thing. And I was like, oh, God. And he was like, you know, like probably like 10 pounds, 10 pounds, 5 pence or something like that. And the woman was ringing it up. And she said, 10 pounds, 5 pence. And he said, how much is that in real money? <laughs> like in, in Great Britain, pounds and pence is real money. It's not monopoly money. He wanted to know what dollars because dollars is real money so he was being super ethnocentric and i just said you know, i'm sorry i'm from canada i don't know these people um anyway i want to give you an example of the challenge of ethnocentrism because we generally generally think of ethnocentrism as a bad thing and cultural relativism is a more appropriate way of looking at cultures okay has anybody ever heard the acronym fgm fgm do you know what that stands for? Especially if you're an anthropology student, you might have heard it. FGM. FGM stands for female genital mutilation. That's a pleasant topic. Female genital mutilation. In many tribal societies around the world, this isn't tied to any particular religion. It's just something that's practiced in different parts of the world in tribal cultures. Um, there are rites of passage transitions from childhood to adulthood. We'll have this discussion as well. In some cultures, that includes when girls become women usually around the age of 12 or 13 in the culture, especially at the onset of menarche or the beginning of the menstrual cycles, uh, women, young girls are circumcised. And what this entails is their clitoris being cut off and their vagina being sewn up. So there's just enough room for them to urinate. That's it. And it's often done by a tribal elder, usually a woman, and often in very unsterile, you know, kind of horrible by our standards, uh, settings uh, and incredibly painful. G many girls die during this process. The belief among some of these tribes is if a girl's clitoris is not removed, it will continue to grow larger and larger into the size of a penis, and then a woman will be sexually insatiable like men are. Uh, the idea also is that it preserves the girl's virginity until her wedding night by being sewn up 
uh, and that her husband literally rips her open on her wedding night uh, and, you know, makes a woman uh, out of a girl. And it's incredibly brutal. Oh, man, it's just hard to imagine, you know, my daughter having being put through that when she turns 12 or 13. It's just it's really hard to imagine. So how do we be ethnocentric about that? Really? I mean, think about it. Well, that's just the way they do it. In their culture, you know, these values are... It's hard because it is about controlling female sexuality. It's about restricting women's ability to have sexual pleasure, right? When your clitoris is removed. Uh, And it's really about a patriarchal physical statement onto a, a female's body. But... And, you know, I'm not going to say don't be ethnocentric about it. I mean, there are a lot of women who are returning to these countries. Like, you know, there are tribes, for example, in Somalia, where this is widespread, um, who are returning to these tribes to say, hey, this happened to me. It needs to stop. Uh, but, you, so you might have heard about FGM. Have you heard about MGM? Not the movie theater, uh, movie studio. MGM, male genital mutilation. We do that in our culture. Every single day, every single day, we have boys who are being circumcised or being mutilated. They're having the foreskins of their penises sliced off. And we do it when they're a day old, so we figure out, well, they're babies, so they don't really feel pain. (laughs) Uh, I think babies feel that pain. Uh, Why don't we look at that as savage as we look at female gender mutilation? Because it's done to babies instead of 13-year-olds? Somehow that's better? I mean, what's the value of it? It, There was a value to uh, circumcision, you know, 2,000 years ago when people lived in the desert or people lived in unhygienic environments because, this is what here we're going to get a little graphic, you know, it's possible that you get a little dirt under the foreskin of the penis and it kind of, you know, gets all nasty under there, uh, what the Hebrews called smegma, if you've ever heard that word, that's what that refers to. And then when dirty penis guy hooks up with clean vagina woman, and all of a sudden clean vagina isn't clean anymore because the smegma has been introduced into the vagina, and that's going to create problems, especially in carrying babies to, to term. And again, be fruitful and multiply. You want to have as many babies as possible. So one of the ways to increase child uh, birth rates and successful healthy children being born, carried to term and being born alive, is to, to reduce the toxins that are injected into the process through the uncircumcised penis. So it made, us, made sense 2,000 years ago to just snip that little piece of the skin off and therefore there's less smegma and more babies. Completely functional. Now, we got all kinds of soaps. We got all kinds of body washes, you could axe, you know, all kinds of ways to keep that area clean. You know, circumcision now is not required to produce healthy babies. It's not, it's not, it doesn't make sense anymore. So why do we do it? It's aesthetic because we want boys to look like the men in the porn movies. I mean, what the, what's the real reason behind doing male genital mutilation? I mean, seriously, and this is one of the reasons when um, we found out we were having a baby, <laughs> we found out we were having a baby and, um, you know, you want to know what the sex is. I mean, I didn't want to know, but my wife did. So there was no way that she was going to be able to keep it a secret from me. And I really wanted a girl. I wanted a girl for multiple reasons. One is let's raise badass warrior women who will bring patriarchy to its knees. But the real reason... <laughs> Not the real reason, but one of the reasons that I really wanted a girl was um, I didn't want to have to deal with the circumcision question, to cut or not cut. I didn't want my son, you know, 20 years later to be like, Dad, why did you do that? You took away a part of my body. Um, That pain may be lodged in my psyche, but it certainly removed my sensation of my penis because that big chunk of very uh, sensitive skin was removed without my consent. So, um, so FGM represents, female gender mutilation represents sort of a challenge of how we actually accomplish uh, cultural relativism, how easy it is sometimes to be ethnocentric and how we sort of have to look, really look back on our culture and say, well, what, do we do some of the same things? Maybe they're both problematic. Maybe FGM and MGM are both problematic. And that's a way of sort of getting around that. 
Hope that makes sense. That would make a really good essay question on a midterm. I'm not saying, I'm just saying. Okay. So let's talk now about where um, culture comes from. Of course, all this culture, all these complex rules and the values behind them and all the sanctions. and Well, there is actually kind of an easy answer to this question about where culture comes from. And the answer is culture comes from culture. Culture comes from culture. Culture evolves. Culture sort of evolves. And it kind of happens in kind of three different ways. And cultural anthropologists would spend a lot of time on this. And I'm going to try spend a little bit of time on it and then try to talk about how it applies to, to one of my favorite music forms. Okay, so the first type of cultural evolution, cultural form is called, um, the first source of culture is called cultural discovery, cultural discovery. And what cultural discovery is, is one culture learning about something another culture does and bringing into their culture. You know, like Columbus discovered America, uh, right? Maybe he thought he was somewhere else, right? Uh, he thought he was in India. Uh, but he brought, he discovered all kinds of things. He discovered corn. He discovered tobacco. He discovered ideas about sort of utopia and brought those back to the European world. Corn is now the number one product, agricultural product on earth. It's discovered from the native people. Uh, tobacco, every corner of the earth, even in Antarctica, they're lighting up a smoke right now. Uh, you know, that was brought in. We discover things and bring them in. The... Um, I think about bagels. Like, how common are bagels in our culture? I had one today. How common are bagels? You know, that comes from Jewish culture. That was sort of a... It used to be, <laughs> back in the day, the only place you could find a good bagel was in a Jewish deli, you know, in the Bronx. Like, the, now there are bagels everywhere, right? It was discovered by non-Jews, mainly wasps. People like me are like, hey... I mean, I, I didn't have a bagel until I was 19 years old. I'm from the land of Krispy Kreme donuts. So the first time I had a bagel... I was like, what's wrong with this donut? <laughs> Why is it so chunky? Um, we've discovered these things and brought them into our culture. Shoes. That's, you know, that was a cultural discovery. The Egyptians and then, the, the, you know, the Europeans and the Middle Easterns were like, that's kind of a good idea. I think we're going to bring that into our culture. So shoes now have been brought into culture. So, And that includes ideas. You know, how we discover the Enlightenment, right? That was a bunch of settlers in the United States that were finding out that these French guys were thinking about this notion of rationality and empiricism, and they kept going over to Paris. People like Thomas Jefferson and, you know, Benjamin Franklin were like, the French have this really great idea. Maybe we should bring it over and incorporate it into our culture. And so cultural discovery is bringing stuff in from other cultures. A lot of culture comes from other cultures, including the traditions that we have. You know, I mentioned that Americans now are getting more uh, comfortable with taking their shoes off when they go to somebody's house. Right? We have culturally discovered that other people around the world do that. Here's the big cultural discovery that uh, has happened this spring. The bidet. <laughs> Just, I can't talk about the bidet enough as I've been a fan of the bidet a long, woo, a long time. Uh, there's a lot of Americans now that have culturally discovered the benefit of the bidet, especially since they can't buy toilet paper anymore. So they need to find something and they've brought it into the culture. And you better believe at the end of the year, there will be a lot more bidets in use um, in the United States of America than there have in previous years. The flip side of this cultural discovery is cultural diffusion, diffusion. So if you know, if you had a, like a cellular biology class, you know, diffusion is when something that's concentrated spreads out. You know, when you drop some Alka-Seltzer, when I drop the emergency into the hot water, it's spread out. It's very cool how that happens. So diffusion is sort of the spreading out. It's sort of the flip side. So if we go back to the Columbus example, for the people that were here, it wasn't like Columbus showed up and discovered them. And they were like, oh, shit, we didn't know we existed until Columbus told us we were here. But for them, a lot of that spreading out of tobacco and corn and, you know, the kind of cultural things that were being brought back to the New World, for them, it wasn't discovery because they already, <coughs> excuse me, they already knew about it. It was diffusion. It was the spreading out. So for Jewish people, the spreading out of bagels is not cultural discovery, it's cultural diffusion. They were like, yeah, we know about bagels for a long time. Uh, for the Egyptian shoes, they've had shoes for, you know, 
thousands and thousands of years. Hey, we were doing shoes before anybody else. How about zero? The use of zero. You know, the people in Iraq were like, yeah, we invented zero. Assholes. Not everybody's using zeros. Like, it spreads out. Now, here's an interesting thing, and we're, we're going to come back to this when we get into hip-hop. What does that feel like? Because remember the discussion that we had in the previous videos about how norms, including bagels and shoes and democracy, you know, all these sort of norms that we have, are connected to values. They're manifestations of values. Sometimes when things spread out, diffuse out, they spread out and are not connected to the values anymore. So here's a, an example that you might know. Have you ever had a, a musician or a band that you really liked that not a lot of people knew about and then they got really big? Like I knew about Billie Eilish when, you know, she was only on YouTube and nobody else knew her. Now everybody's like, Billie Eilish, blah, blah, blah. Like, what does that feel like? What does that feel? I knew them when. I knew them before they got big. Right? When they were little, they were sort of connected to their values and everybody listened to them, kind of shared the values. And then they go way out and all of a sudden the people were just doing it because it's fashionable. Here's a really good example. White people with dreadlocks. <laughs> There is a cultural, there's a reason dreadlocks are called dread. It's the dread of Babylon. It's the dread of white society. Emerged in Ethiopia, uh, really in the 1960s, became sort of this hairstyle to show your opposition, your, your African opposition to white colonial society. And there's a real value connected with that. It is sort of like a casting off of white racism. And to see a white kid with dreadlocks, they're just doing it because it's cool. Right. So it is diffused outward, but without the values. And there's a term for that. It's called value stretch. Value stretch means the culture diffuses out and becomes separated from the values that helped create it. Uh, and so you can imagine why there are probably some Rastafarians when they see, you know, a white kid with dreadlocks. They're like, oh, man, you are you are uh, the dread uh, in the dreadlock. Um, you are culturally appropriating this thing. I mean, from, from this perspective, all culture is cultural appropriation. The cultural appropriation sort of refers to that value stretch element of taking the culture without the value that's behind it. So you may have heard that term, cultural appropriation. It's really about diffusion. Um, diffusion and, and, and discovery being two sides of the same coin. Okay, the third... Uh, the third spread, the third way that culture is formed is through cultural invention. Cultural invention. Cultural invention just uh, refers to the impact of technology. How the invention of the wheel changed culture, right? I mean, we often talk about three. Well, not often, but people uh, who, especially chaos theories, talk about three bifurcation points in human existence. There have been three points that where the human culture changed radically. Uh, and the first was the invention of agriculture, uh, when we um, figure out, you know, instead of wandering around all the time, we could just take the seeds from the stuff that we eat and plant it in the ground and, you know, plow the ground and dig the ground and then stay where we are and start building places in one place, like a city. Uh, and then about 4,000 years later, uh, the invention of the wheel uh, which allowed people, 5,000 years later, the invention of the wheel allowed people to travel to other places and carry their stuff for trade. And then about 5,000 years after that was the invention of the computer, which allowed us to store masses of amounts of information and sort of think in ways that we weren't normally thinking and thinking about the world and going to the moon and stuff like that. Um, and so, you know, these technologies dramatically changed our culture. Think about how the invention of the car has changed our culture, or the invention of the cell phone. I mean, this incredible technological advance that we carry in our pockets is so massive compared to what computers used to be. I mean, you know, in the 1960s, computers took whole rooms up, and the, the phone that you have is a more powerful computer than any of those giant roomfuls of spinning wheels uh, from the 1960s. And so that's changed our culture, that we can manage this pandemic because of the technology. Imagine if this happened, this COVID-19 happened in the 1970s before the internet and before anything other than network TV. Like, how would we be managing other than just sitting and watching, you know, the evening news every night? I mean, it's just really changed our culture. How many people do you know who have developed romantic relationships based on somebody they met online. It used to be such a weird thing. Oh my God, they got together on a computer dating service. Now it's, it's just like the majority of people I know who are booed up uh, met online. 
I'm old fashioned. I like to meet people in bars. Okay. So, uh, so cultural discovery, cultural diffusion, cultural invention. Those are our three ways that we get culture. So I wanted to use as a, an example, I'm going to try to do this really quickly. I normally would take up like a whole class to do this, to talk a little bit about the evolution of, of rap music, which is now the dominant form of music on earth. And this year, it is the number one selling form of music everywhere on earth. There's jihadi rap, there's K-pop rap. I mean, there's just all over the world, we've got various versions of hip hop. Where did that come from? Well, obviously, we have to start in Africa. We start with African tradition. This is such a quick version of the history of hip hop. We start with African traditions that are around for centuries. Uh, and the two traditions that are really relevant here uh, in African music, especially in Central and West Africa, which is the main place that we're talking about, is uh, the importance of drumming, the importance of, you know, the rhythmic message. Like if you watch old Tarzan movies, there's a scene somewhere where, you know, there is some, uh, you know, local guide who's guiding uh, the hunters, the white hunters into the jungle and you'll hear some drumming and they'll say, oh, Boana means the natives are restless. Like that drum beat means something. And so different drum beats were different codes. And so you could tell if something was a celebration or something was a war beat or something was a warning. Uh, you know, the drum beat was used as a way of communicating because people didn't have that and they didn't have a lot of written words. So drum beat was very important. And the other thing that was important is the importance of song as telling stories. So if you have a culture that doesn't have a lot of written history, how do you keep your stories alive? You turn them into songs, and songs are forms of communication. And you know this. If you know anything about Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer had a very shiny nose, and if you ever picked it, I can't know. You know exactly what happens in that story because you've heard that song so many times, right? You know exactly what happens to Rudolph and how he comes to save the day. No spoilers, because I think you already know uh, that story because you know that song. So in Africa, songs were used to keep sort of stories and traditions and news alive. Okay, that's a nutshell of African uh, cultural music history right there. Uh, when the slave trade starts in the 1700s, and, you know, it starts really before that, but the 1700s really picks up steam. Uh, and they really start stealing all these people from Africa, kidnapping and murdering them and turn, turning tribe against tribe. There's a lot of, there are thousands of African cultures and thousands of languages that are spoken. And purposely from the crafty um, slavers, they would pick people from different tribes, you know, and put them all on a boat together so they couldn't talk to each other. So a lot of people lost a lot of their culture and they lost a lot of their language because they couldn't speak in their language to the guy next to them to say, what the hell is going on? Because that person spoke a different language. But as that diaspora, as that spreading of the people from Africa to the New World moved across the ocean, across this you know massive expanse that was you know so treacherous and so many people died along the way, uh, that culture persisted. I love using this map of the world. I like using this map of the world. Do you notice anything about this particular map that I'm showing right now? This is a map of the world, and we're looking at crossing from Africa to the Americas. Um, usually when we draw the world, uh, we put the, all the white countries on top. But in space, there is no up or down. North isn't up and south isn't down. We just orient ourselves that way. That's a social construction. We, the, the Earth could be sideways or it could be, quote unquote, upside down. So this picture of the Earth is just as uh, valid as any other picture of the Earth. But it just puts the black and brown countries on the top. Sorry. Sorry, white people. Anyway, uh, that journey was so treacherous that a lot of people didn't make it. The culture survived. The culture survived, but a lot of people didn't make it and became kind of not a good capitalist enterprise to go spend all this energy to steal all these people. And then, you, you know, you finally get to the new world. And Brazil was the main recipient of, of slaves, even more than, uh, than America was. Um, you know, and there's only a handful of them left because they've died of typhoid and they've died of you know, cholera and all these horrible diseases along the way. I mean, it's just the most abusive, hor and we'll, we'll talk about the slave trade. So what happened, it, be, it became kind of more advantageous from a capitalistic perspective to steal people from Africa who were good breeders, men and women who looked like they could sire a bunch of kids, and take them 
uh, and then take their children and sell the children into slavery, like animal husbandry. I mean, literally, it was a version of that. So the Caribbean, the Caribbean islands, including places like Haiti and Jamaica uh, and Cuba, became sort of places to bring the slaves and then breed them like animals and then take their children to New Orleans or take their children to Virginia. And so the Caribbean became a kind of hotbed of African culture that while people might not have been able to speak to each other, the importance of rhythm and the importance of song as telling stories persisted because that was very African. And if you know places like Haiti, you know, if you think of voodoo, voodoo is a, a mix of Catholicism and African animism. It's sort of mixing together of these religions that become the sort of this the synthesis there in Haiti. Okay, so we're going to jump ahead a few years to Jamaica. In Jamaica, there is a cultural uh, form that starts to emerge in the late 1950s called Calypso. And Calypso is kind of island music. It's very tied to African song telling uh, and African rhythms. And there is a guy uh, who you might know named Harry Belafonte. He's still with us. Uh, and if you know the Banana Boat song, it goes a little something like this. Day-o, day-o, daylight come and me want to go home. Um, I'll include some links below for this so you don't have to hear me sing all these songs. Anyway, Calypso starts uh, interacting with some of the m music that's coming in from America because of things like radio, the cultural invention of the radio. So they're starting to hear things like R&B music, like coming in from New Orleans, you know, over the airwaves. Uh, and it starts to emerge. In the early 60s, Calypso kind of has an offshoot of something called ska. Ska music. Ska music. All right. We're going to do some music. Okay. This is uh, Desmond Decker. This is just some Jamaican ska. And that beat, that, that was culturally diffused from Africa. That was an African beat, the ska beat. So the ska, the ska music uh, that became very popular in poor areas of Jamaica that were poor black Africanized uh, places and that the poor folks, you know, didn't have a lot of resources, right? So one of the things that became very popular is having a street party, having a, any type of party where somebody was playing this great ska music. And a lot of the music uh, that was ska was instrumental. Was it singing like, like the Desmond Decker was just sort of this instrumental beat with somebody playing the saxophone and you would have a DJ and the DJ would play these great instrumental records and everybody would dance and the DJ would talk over the records and talk about how their sound system was the best sound system, how their parties were the best parties, how they threw the, the most, you know, coolest parties around and everybody should come and hang out with them and this sort of talking over the records was called toasting and they would just toast to these ska records and have these big parties and be like yeah mom i got the greatest sound system ba -boom, ba -boom, ba -boom, ba -boom, ba and uh became very popular and so it just sort of stayed there in, in places like kingston uh jamaica gets its independence from britain in 1964 and there starts to become some emigration emigration from jamaica so we jump ahead uh, to the, we're talking about the cultural diffusion uh, to um, 19, early 1970s and this guy and he's so important in the history of hip hop. This guy who was coming from Kingston, he was just this kid really who moved from Kingston, Jamaica, named Cool Herc, DJ Cool Herc, and he moves to a place called the South Bronx, probably the poorest area of New York City in the 1970s. And um, he says, hey, where's the, where are the toasters? And they're like, well, there's no toasters here. And so he's like, well, let me show you what we do down in Kingston. And he sets up a sound system. And he doesn't have the ska records, but he's got these disco records. And disco records, um, you know, disco was starting to get popular in the 1970s. And disco records would typically have a, a part where they're singing. And then there was an you know, instrumental part called the break. The break of the song, the sort of instrumental part of the song. So if you could get, like the toasters had in Jamaica, this is a cultural invention, two turntables and a microphone, I could get two versions of the same record, especially if you could get like a 12-inch 12, 12 disco record. That for you people that don't know, look like this. This is one record 
on a 12 inch vinyl record one song uh, and I could set the needle down right at the break right at the instrumental part and if I had the exact same record on the other turntable when this one gets at the end of the instrumental section, I can set the needle down on the instrumental beginning of this one, and I can keep it going forever. And you know what I can do over that instrumental section? I can toast, or what was called in the 70s, rapping. Rapping was talking, like, you know, your dad wants to rap to you, and you're like, oh, God, Dad. Rapping was just a way of saying, it was like the hip way of saying, let's talk, let's rap. And so DJ Cool Herc started doing this with these disco records, where he was talking rapping over these instrumental breaks in these disco records in the South Bronx. And people were like, what the hell? This is the coolest thing ever. And th those parties became very big. And there was a sort of culture that emerged around this that became known as hip hop. Because part of the language was hippity hop and you don't stop. It was one of the ways of rhyming to the beat. Uh, when you're feeling the heat and you're out on the street, hippity hop and you don't stop on and on to the break of dawn. Um, and so a, a kind of culture emerged in the South Bronx that included this rapping. It included this new form of dancing called break dancing, which was very different than the disco dancing that the white kids were doing. It included graffiti art and spray painting incredible murals on walls and on subway trains. And it just was kind of confined to the South Bronx for a big chunk of the 80s. And then it started to get out. Some of these records started picking up, you know, there started to be some records and they started getting the attention, especially the attention of white people. All right, there's so we're, we're gonna about to have this big cultural discovery moment. There is, at the same time in the 70s, there's a club on the south side uh, of Manhattan called CBGB's. It's a punk rock club and bands like the Ramones and Blondie and Television and Talking Heads and all these sort of white punk rock artists are playing there. And there's a long history of white kids liking black music. Right, Elvis Presley, the white kid that sang the black music. It goes way, way back, pre Eminem, you know, way back to the beginning. Because w white teenagers feel alienated, black people feel alienated living in a racist society. So, you know, white kids are like, that's my music. And of course, those white kids grow up to be assholes, but, and black people stay black and alienated. But there is this sort of long connection between white music, white kids, and black music. And so uh, there was this promoter this promoter in the South Bronx who was putting on these hip-hop shows named Fab Five Freddy, and he went to Hilly Michaels, who owned CBGB's, and said, hey, you know, you guys are all into what we're doing. Let me put together a show. Let me put together a hip-hop show. We'll come over to CBGB's. We'll come over the river, uh, over the East River, and um, we'll have a hip-hop night, and you guys can check it out, what we do. And so, you know, they were all crazy, like, let's do it, let's do it. And so there was... Uh, and that night, this huge cultural discovery of these white artists, these musicians, watching people rapping, breakdancing, doing graffiti art in this tiny little shithole club called CBGB's, which is long gone. It's not like an upscale dress shop on on uh, the Bowery. Um, I once threw up in the toilet at CBGB's, but that's a story for another day. The uh, one of many people... <laughs> <laughs> Not the only person ever throw up in that toilet. Um, the uh, these white artists were like, "Oh my God, this is insane! This is really good." And one of those artists was a band that was starting to get some success called Blondie, and they recorded a record in 1979 that came out in early 1980 called Rapture, in which they culturally discovered and did rap music as they heard it from these. Uh, African-American folks coming from the South Bronx. And in fact, the, the song even mentions Fab Five Freddy. Fab Five, Fab Five Freddy said, everybody's flash. DJ said, hey, mama, flash is flash, flash. Anyway, I could do the whole thing, but I won't. Uh, that record, which is in here also somewhere, uh, became a huge hit. It became a huge hit. And all of a sudden, people that were very far away from the South Bronx were culturally discovering this thing called rap music. This is 1980, and people were hearing this music that they never heard before, and it was getting very big. I remember, because, you know, I was 16 in 1980, and all of a sudden, everybody wanted to know about rap music. The Clash was doing rap. I mean, everybody was kind of, like, getting into this sort of rap music. And so there is a cultural diffusion for the hip-hop artists. So here you have Value Stretch, right? Here you have Value Stretch. All of a sudden, this new thing is being brought in, like bagels being brought in, uh, to mainstream culture. And for the people that were there, that were the creators, they were like, hey, wait a second. And the original rap music was all about having a good time. Hotel, motel, holiday, and say what? I mean, it was all about 
eating pork and beans and like all the songs were all crazy about having a good time. All of a sudden, all these white people were listening to this music that came out of the ghetto. There was this value stretch. So what was the response? We were like, oh, yeah, well, I guess we're all going to get rich now. No, the response was let's recreate it. Let's recreate. And this is the natural reaction. And you can find it in all cultural forms, punk rock, heavy metal, whatever, uh, that when it spreads out too far, there is a need to either abandon or recreate it. So in 1982, there's a record that comes out called The Message by Grandmaster Flash. This is it right here. 1982, 12 inch on the Sugar Hill, which is from the Bronx. This is probably worth a pretty penny these days and it was a more grittier picture of life in the ghetto instead of being about partying and hippity hop and you don't stop it was about life in poverty don't push me because i'm close to the edge i might even lose my head it's like a jungle sometimes it makes me wonder how i keep from going under oh, 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 oh. child was born with no state of mind blind to the ways of mankind okay i'll, I'll include a link to the message <laughs> Because this is the ultimate, you know, cultural diffusion when you have, you know, a 50-something professor doing Grandmaster Flash's the message in his attic. Sorry. Sorry, Bronx and Brooklyn and, you know, greater Manhattan. Uh, so, um, so again, you know, trying to resist the cultural diffusion and creating something new creating something new in response to the diffusion. And of course, that starts to spread, right? I mean, you get, you know, that ultimately ends up becoming much popular in the forms of groups like Run DMC. And then there's the creation of gangster rap in the late 80s, groups like NWA and uh, you know, Tupac Shakur and Notorious B.I.G. I mean, those artists were trying to get harder and then it spreads out again and there's attempts to recreate it, you know, going all the way to Kendrick Lamar, trying to say, hey, this is our music. I mean, there are all these sort of waves of rap where there's the diffusion, which leads to value stretch, and then there's a need to recreate it, to resist the value stretch, to bring it back to the notion that cultural norms, in this case rap music, are expression of values. When they get separated from the values, mainly by like white kids in Idaho trying to dress like they're, you know, rap stars, um, there is a um, there's a need to recreate it. There's a really great, speaking of white kids, there's a really great Eminem record uh, called uh, Yellow Brick Road that's about, you know, a white kid, this guy Marshall Mathers, uh, loving rap music and thinking that he could be black, including using the N-word, and realizing he was culturally appropriating and having to be respectful and understand the values where that comes from. I love that, I love that record for the sociological reasons, but there's also a secret reason I love that, which is I'm on the record. I'm actually sampled on the record. If you listen to that record, uh, Yellow Brick Road, uh, from Eminem's Encore album, 2004, I think. One of the first things you hear is my voice. I don't understand why that is. But um, so that that's a quick version, uh, a, a very quick version. But you get cultural discovery, people saying, hey, this music, you know, we like it. Let's bring it in uh, to our culture. You know, have like hip hop workout classes now and hip hop references in sports. And like it's just been discovered in all these different types of forms. You also get the diffusion, the diffusion of African musical forms out and out and out and out. Right. I mean, what we experience is rap music now is a direct descendant of those cultural drumming traditions in, in Central Africa, in places like Burundi, uh, and the importance of song as telling a story. So the cultural diffusion, and all throughout, is, there's a role of technology, especially two turntables and the microphone, uh, the invention of sampling, the invention of you know digital uh, recording that we have now. It all plays into the notion of culture that gives us what is now. You know, I was there in 1979 when the first rap records were coming out and people were like, oh, it's just a fad. It'll be over two seconds. It'll be here. It'll be gone. Um, here we are now, you know, 40 something years later. Uh, and rap is the biggest music form in the world because of diffusion, discovery, and cultural invention. Don't stop. Won't stop. All right. That's it. Uh, that's all I'm going to say. Go out and listen to some good hip-hop. Uh, host a socially responsible and distance hip-hop dance party. Just remember where it comes from. Peace!